Hello and welcome to the next episode of Arthroplasty Dialogues. I'm your host, Dr. Sahil Sangvi, and in today's podcast, we'll be talking about DARE, that is, debridement, antibiotics, and implant retention for periprosthetic joint infection after total knee arthroplasty. And our guest for today is Dr. Carlos Higuera. Dr. Carlos Higuera is currently a staff surgeon at the Cleveland Clinic in Florida, where he divides his time between leadership, research, and patient care. He is the chairman of the Levitich Department of Orthopedic Surgery at Cleveland Clinic, Florida, and the director of the Orthopedic and Rheumatology Center. Dr. Higuera completed his residency at the Cleveland Clinic and a clinical fellowship thereafter at the Thomas Jefferson University Hospital. He specializes in hip and knee arthroplasty surgery and uses alternative approaches to optimize recovery. He is interested in complex revision procedures, including infections. His research interest is mainly in periprosthetic joint infections, including diagnostic tools, patient optimization, and overall outcomes after arthroplasty. He is currently working on developing new technologies to diagnose and treat such infections and has also been the past president of the Musculoskeletal Infection Society. Dr. Higuera, welcome to our podcast and thank you for joining us today. My pleasure. Periprosthetic joint infection is a devastating complication associated with hip and knee arthroplasty. The probability of a successful treatment for PJI is multifactorial. While two-stage revision surgery is still considered the gold standard treatment for PJI, DARE has been advocated as an attractive treatment option due to the reduced morbidity and improved function with a view to attempt salvage of the index arthroplasty surgery. So getting started with this topic, could you tell us what is DARE and what is the concept behind it? Uh, DARE uh, by definition, is um, the treatment and retention um, of implants. And the concept behind it is to try to do a less morbid procedure, try to save the implants. That's particularly important when you have uh, cemented prosthesis um, or large prosthesis because the morbidity associated with uh, full uh, explant or removal of the components is pretty significant. Um, some groups, uh, for example, uh, the, the group from Joe Parbi, J, uh, Jay Parbisi has um, demonstrated in the past that when you do a full uh, two stage, in some of these cases, the mortality uh, and these patients at five years can be up to 25%, which is higher than most of the common cancers that we deal with uh, these days. So that's where the concept of there is um, useful and applicable. Now, the predominant determinant factor for considering the utility of DARE has been the time frame, And this is important as the longer the time period is from the index surgery, the more it allows for biofilm formation and maturation. During the recent ICM meeting, that is the international consensus meeting, most delegates believed that a binary division between acute and chronic PGI based on time from index arthroplasty was rather illogical. So what is the upper limit of the time frame when you would consider DARE and what are the indications, the relative and absolute contraindications for DARE? Sure. So the main indications are when you have either um, acute drainage from early index procedure. So when we have, for example, a cemented total knee arthroplasty that has been draining uh, usually for less than seven days, that could be a good indication for a their procedure. Also acute hematogenous infections that have had symptoms for less than four weeks 
are a clear indication for their uh, both indications have been supported by the international consensus meeting in uh, 2018. Uh, moreover, in terms of the contraindications, if any of these time frames have uh, been passed, there are probably uh, contraindications for there. Uh, through the literature, uh, we have learned that the longer you wait to do the dare, the higher chances of failure um, we have. Now, if you stay within those time frames, uh, a couple of groups have uh, developed some um, predictors for failures. And, and that's where it comes the, the click and the crime 80 uh, risk certifications. These are basically just acronyms for a, a list of risk factors. And those risk factors include uh, chronic liver disease, um, chronic cirrhosis, uh, renal failure. Uh, if the prosthesis that have been placed is for a fracture or a revision, and if you have a elevated CRP, usually if it's 100, uh, above 100 uh, to 150 uh, milligrams per deciliter, uh, all these are um, predictors of failure for there. So there is an appealing surgical procedure for management of acute PGI as it carries low morbidity. However, the outcomes of this procedure are unpredictable and the reported failure rates after the procedure vary significantly. Could you tell us, on one hand, what factors are associated with higher likelihood of success with DARE? And on the other hand, what are the poor prognostic factors? Sure. So high success uh, is related with, let's, let's keep in mind again, those, those three factors that I mentioned before. Um, the timing, so the, if the timing of the maturation of the infection or the biofilm has been short, uh, then your chances of uh, being successful are more significant. Um, in terms of the patient, if you have a healthy patient with no comorbidities, good bone stock, no, no loose prosthesis, soft tissues look healthy, less inflammation that is measured by the inflammatory markers, um, those are good predictors of success. And finally, if you have a causative uh, agent, the bacteria that is uh, non-virulent bacteria like C. acnes or staph epi that is sensitive to uh, methicillin, uh, those are predictors of success. On the other hand, the predictors of failure are the opposite, as I, as I mentioned before. So if you catch the infection too late, you know, more than seven days of drainage, then we start seeing a, a significant increase of failures. Um, if the patient has been symptomatic in an acute hematogenous infection for more than three to four weeks, we start seeing a significant amount of failures. Uh, again, there are a couple of uh, groups in uh, one here in the US, one in Europe that develop um, some uh, risk certification uh, criteria for failure. Uh, that's the uh, CLIC scale. Uh, CLIC is basically an acronym for uh, the K is it stands for uh, chronic renal failure, and they they have they give uh, different values for for um, um, these failures. So, chronic renal failure give you two points. Uh, L is for uh, liver cirrhosis that gives you one point five uh, points. I is for the index surgery if the prosthesis was done for a fracture or a revision uh, that gives you one point five points. And C is if there is a cemented prosthesis uh, that gives you two points. And finally, if the CRP is higher than 115 uh, milligrams per liter, that gives you 2.5 points. And I believe if you have more than uh, seven points, your chances of failure are more than 100%. Um, 
On the other hand, the, the ninja group uh, in Europe, in combination with some groups in the US, they, uh, they had came out with their own scale is the CRIME 80. Um, the CRIME is just an acronym. Uh, C stands for COPD or CRP higher than 150 milligrams per liter. Uh, the COPD gives you two points. The elevated CRP gives you one point. The R stands for uh, rheumatoid arthritis that gives you three points. The I is the if the indication uh, prosthesis was done for a fracture that gives you three points. Uh, M is for males, so all males give you one point. And E is uh, exchange of uh, mobile components. Actually, that gives you a minus one point, so it's uh, uh, in favor of uh, better outcomes. And finally, 80 is patients that are older than 80 years have two points. And then when you add them up, if you have more than five points, you have about 80% uh, failure rate. Great. That was indeed informative to know about the click and crime AT scores. So moving on to the OR, could you tell us how many samples do you take? What, how much volume and what is the type of irrigation solutions you use with or without any additives? Is there a role of absorbable calcium sulfate beads or pellets? And do you change your OR setup after or in between the surgery? Sure. Um, so these cases are always uh, treated with what we call and clean and dirty setup. In, in other words, um, we have two set of instruments um, and we basically, uh, we, we do the surgery in two steps. In the first step, uh, we do the whole uh, irrigation, the Britman, uh, removal of the modular components, uh, and then we use all our uh, antimicrobial solutions. Um, or irrigation uh, with the concept of doing um, both uh, mechanical and chemical uh, disruption of the biofilm. Uh, and more or less the order of solutions that we use is, uh, I, I call it the rule of three, because we start, uh, we use normal saline, three liters uh, of irrigation. Then uh, we add, Hydrogen peroxide is, uh, again, usually try to keep in mind the, the rule of three. It's about 100 ml uh, at 3% of hydrogen peroxide combined with 100 ml of sterile water. It's a 50-50 solution, and we leave it in the wound for about three minutes. Then we irrigate again with three liters of normal saline, and then we add one liter of diluted uh, povidone uh, iodine, which is about 30 ml of povidone iodine is a sterile in about a liter of normal saline and we leave it for three minutes and then we irrigate um, with three liters of normal saline. Uh, now, before we do the final irrigation of the three liters of normal saline, uh, then we re kind of do a loose closure of the wound and, the, and we do a new uh, draping and prep. We change all the instruments. We come, we, we bring the, what we call the clean set of instruments. And then we open the wound again, uh, do the final irrigation with three liters, and then we put the clean uh, modular components, and then we do the closure. Uh, we rarely do now uh, calcium sulfate uh, beads unless we had a significant bone um, defect. If we don't have a bone defect, uh, we don't use um, really any of these uh, devices as mo now multiple studies, some of them level one studies have shown that they, there is no difference. And at least here in the US, uh, those beads are significantly expensive. So we are going away from using um, those. And then the, maybe the final thing that is that we use uh, almost in all these cases is some sort of a, an incisional back dressing. Mm -hmm. um, and then we use uh, parental antibiotics for at least six to eight weeks. And then after that, uh, we use chronic suppression, oral chronic suppression 
for at least three months uh, on all these patients, depending on the, on the cultures. And we tailor the antibiotics depending on the cultures. Um, that's okay. what we do. Right. Now that we're done with the operative protocols, let's move on to the post-operative management with regards to the antibiotics. So biofilm is by far the single most important factor causing resistance of bacteria to the antibiotics in the treatment of PGI, which is why the concept of achieving a minimum biofilm eradication concentration, that is MBEC, of antibiotics at the site of infection is plausible, but the routine administration of intraarticular antibiotics in the treatment of PJI is not yet clear. So what is your post-operative antibiotic protocol? That is oral IV. Is there a role of intraosseous antibiotics in your practice? What is the duration of antibiotics? And lastly, how do you treat culture negative infections? Yeah, great questions. Um... I mean, most of the time, the majority, the, the majority of our infections are either caused by uh, Staph aureus or Star epi. Um, and probably a third of those are resistant to methicillin. So for the most part, if it's the first time that patient has an infection, the majority of these cases are treated um, um, with vancomycin IV. Uh, if it's a resistant bacteria, then we use acephalosporin, either uh, second or third generation cephalosporin. Uh, the role of refamping um, it has becoming more and more debatable and more controversial. There are two level one studies uh, that show that refamping doesn't necessarily um, have a difference in the recurrence of infections or the success of their. Um, what is the role of refamping? Well, we know that refamping um, has a significant effect uh, on, on, on rapid biofilm formation uh, bacteria, particularly uh, strep. Um, uh, so we did one study, it was not a level one study, but it was a case series where we show that uh, refamping actually had a protective effect. So uh, we still use refamping in a lot of, of cases that have been caused by uh, a strep uh, bacteria or uh, a staph uh, bacteria uh, in conjunction with um, either acephalosporin or vancomycin. Now, when we have um, negative cultures. Um, most of the time, then we use dual antibiotic where we have a broad spectrum coverage of gram positive and gram negative. Um, one of my partners here uh, have started to use uh, some uh, local powder of antifungals uh, in the closure in addition to vancomycin uh, powder because we have had an increase in the number of fungal infections. I do not have data to support that, but that's something that I have seen. Um, now, uh, lastly, for um, intraosseous antibiotic, I truly believe that a key component of there that we have been missing through the years is the usage of local high concentration antibiotics. Uh, we know that in the process of uh, disrupting the biofilm, when we do the procedure, either, well, both uh, mechanically with our debridement and chem chemically with the solutions that we use, uh, unfortunately, we still leave behind some biofilm that it can be present intraosseous or some of the deep tissues. And the only way to reach those is with a release of high concentration antibiotics at the local level. We cannot do it systemically because we know that the concentrations that are needed to truly disrupt biofilm 
are sometimes in a magnitude of a thousand uh, uh, times higher than the concentrations that we use uh, systemically. And obviously that's not possible because then the adverse effects of the antibiotics will be uh, very significant. But there are many groups that have been uh, looking at this concept, a uh, couple of groups in China, a um, couple of groups in, in Europe, in the UK and uh, Germany, the endo clinic has been a, a, a pioneer in this. Um, and uh, here in the US, um, Dr. Uh, Krakow uh, used a high concentration antibiotics with an inflow and outflow. Uh, there are some, some uh, cases that have described this concept and also uh, Dr. Uh, Dubovian in uh, Michigan has been using this concept now for more than 10 years. And now uh, they even have a device that uses this. Uh, we have some uh, restrictions here in the US because uh, the FDA hasn't cleared the use of antibiotics in this modality. So it has been difficult uh, to study it. However, recently Tom Ferring in North Carolina have been using um, intra this concept of high concentration antibiotics with intraosis antibiotics when there. He just recently published um, in the Nice Society um, with a series of dares uh, in after knee replacements with a success rate higher than 90% of one year, which is uh, pretty remarkable, at least here in the US. Uh, so we are starting a study, and when I say we, is the, the OREF uh, just started a, um, a new initiative here. It's a multi-center study uh, being led by uh, Dr. Tom Ferring at the Ortho Carolina Group, uh, where they want to see the effect of intraosseous antibiotics uh, in there. Uh, I believe that that's the future. We will have to figure out a way to have uh, local high concentrations antibiotics um, you know, what antibiotics to use and so forth, that's, that's probably a matter of further research, but uh, I think that, that will, that's what is really going to increase the success of this procedure in the future. Okay, so while we're on the topic of antibiotics, let's discuss one particular organism of concern, that is MRSA, which stands for Methicillin Resistant Staph Aureus which does pose a challenge for attempting salvage. Although vancomycin is recommended as the antibiotic of choice for treatment of MRSA infections, there are reports of resistance, treatment failure, and nephrotoxicity. In addition, vancomycin is not bactericidal against the small colony variants of MRSA. So what is the most effective combination of antibiotics in the treatment of acute PJIs caused by MRSA that has undergone surgical management with DARE? And is there a role for addition of rifampin in staph infections? So, um, well, MRSA on my book, and this is more my personal opinion now, and there are some studies that support that. Uh, some of the studies from Tom Ferring. We actually did our own study that didn't show that um, MRSA was necessarily a predictor of uh, failure there. But I almost never would do a DARE procedure if I have MRSA. Uh, if I have MRSA, I will do either a two-stage, if I have a patient that will tolerate more than one surgery, or in the last three years, I have been gravitating more towards uh, what, we, what I would call 1.5 stage, where basically I just do a, a really good dynamic spacer um, with uh, cementing components that, that will elude high concentration antibiotics that are tailored for MRSA, usually vancomycin with tobramycin, um, and they have a synergistic effect. Um, and then afterwards, just to answer your question uh, for the antibiotics, uh, we usually use vancomycin if it's the first time that the patient has the infection. However, if the patient has uh, renal function that is compromised or is the second infection with MRSA, we always use daptomycin instead of uh, vancomycin. 
Okay. Now and, and 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 I'm sorry. And then for the refamping in those particular cases, I don't think that refamping has any role with MRSA. Yep. Now an ideal optimistic scenario is obviously a successful dare, but failure of dare can again bring in a new set of problems. Several authors have reported on outcomes of two-stage exchange revision arthroplasty after a failed attempt at limited debridement with implant retention with variable success. So does performing a dare affect the outcome of a subsequent two-stage arthroplasty? And for failure of dare, would you consider a repeat dare or explantation? And could you talk to us about the concept of a double dare? Yeah. So um, if so, Tom Ferring published almost 15 years ago now that uh, a fail there will uh, increase your chances of failure of a two-stage revision, and almost 60 percent. So it's pretty significant. We then did our own study here at the Cleveland Clinic, and uh, we found that that was not the case. But so that's a little controversial. I will tell you what my opinion is. Um, putting in consideration all the factors that we talked about earlier, I mean, if I really have any doubt that the dare is going to fail, I will go more for either uh, a, a one point, a one or a one point five for a two stage revision, and I won't do it there. Uh, if I already have a fail there, in other words, I do it there and the patient comes back uh, having drainage, any signs that the infection has not been controlled, I go for two-stage revision. Uh, those cases, I never do a one or 1 1.5 stage. I just do a two-stage revision. Um, now, the concept of the double there is pretty interesting. And we have been doing it uh, more and more, particularly on patients that have uh, large prosthesis, large cemented or uncemented femoral components, uh, particularly in the hip, uh, two more prosthesis. Because again, the morbidity uh, of removing these components in those patients is pretty significant. And sometimes it, even the mortality, as I mentioned earlier. So, uh, those are the, the patients where we do a double there, sometimes uh, triple there. So, and, but it's all planned. So uh, basically following what uh, the uh, Dr. Spangle at the um, Mayo Clinic in Arizona described. So the double there uh, is, uh, well, you do, is basically uh, two surgeries in a short period of time. And you keep the patient in the hospital doing those two surgeries. Um, and basically, you do uh, two, the, two dares uh, during that period of time. Um, again, they, they always uh, um, do it with uh, what we call a clean and dirty um, setup, where you bring the patient in, uh, open the wound with one set of, in set of instruments, uh, remove all the modular parts, do a very thorough debridement, uh, then do a mechanical um, disruption of the biofilm, either with a sponge or, um, you know, you just want to wash really well all the prostheses that are left. Then you do a chemical disruption of the biofilm with the protocol that I mentioned before. I don't know if you want me to mention it again, the, the solutions that no, we no. use. No, we got that. But yeah, basically it's just a combination of uh, what we call the rule of three. Um, when you use normal saline, three liters, then you use um, uh, hydrogen peroxide and leave it uh, for uh, three minutes, then irrigate again with three liters of normal saline. Then you put COVID and iodine. Uh, it's a dilution of almost 3% uh, and liver for three minutes, uh, and then normal saline again. Um, but then after you're done with, with that, uh, the irrigation solutions, 
you kind of close the wound partially with like a baseball stitch, then bring new um, drapes, new instruments, remove all the dirty uh, drapes, then open the wound and put the final parts in. <clears throat> um, and then uh, what, what we do also in addition to that for the double there is you put some sort of a deliver of high concentration antibiotics, either uh, antibiotic cement pellets or calcium sulfate pellets uh, with uh, antibiotics that are tailored for the cultures. And then you either uh, put an incision back or a wound back and keep the patient of uh, parental antibiotics for about five days or so. And then after five days, you bring the patient back uh, and do a second debridement, remove the, the cement pellets, uh, whatever is they see necrotic or uh, that needs additional debridement is done. You do the, the mechanical and chemical disruption of the biofilm and then close the wound and keep the patient on uh, parent antibiotics for six to eight weeks and then uh, chronic suppression for another uh, at least three months. Uh, but that's more or less the concept that um, the guys at the Mayo Clinic uh, have described and that's kind of what we have been doing here at the Cleveland Clinic as well. Now, if the second time that you go back, you still see purulence, you see kind of significant inflammation of the tissues, significant necrosis, then you can even plan to do a third there. Uh, anecdotally, I can tell you that we probably have increased our success rate in those patients about 50% when we follow that approach. Um, Dr. Spangle's group with the double dare, um, strategy reported a success rate of more than 90%, which is pretty remarkable. Um, we probably will start looking at the, our success rate with that approach. Um, but uh, anecdotally, I can tell you that uh, do, doing that approach, um, we have been doing uh, better. Now, another very important component of all this is the follow-up, right? Uh, and is, is the use of the antibiotics. You still have to have uh, some sort of parental antibiotics for at least six to eight weeks in addition to chronic suppression. Uh, we published a paper in JBJS almost 10 years ago um, highlighting the importance of doing chronic suppression sometimes for years uh, in their procedures that are caused by uh, Staph aureus or Staph epi. Uh, when we did not use chronic suppression in those cases, the failure rate increased almost in 30% compared with the patients that we did not use uh, chronic suppression. Right. So as we come to the end of this podcast, DARE is definitely an attractive option in the treatment of PJI, but surgical technique is critical to achieving a successful outcome, especially with judicious use and with careful selection of the right patient. Dr. Higuera, thank you so much once again for being with us today. My pleasure. Thank you for the invitation. Thank you.